Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu rasulullah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Qala Allah ta'ala fi kitab al-aziz. Ba'da a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So continuing on with the theme of the early Muslims and people who are accepting Islam at the early points of the prophethood of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One person I wanted to talk about today to begin our lesson is an individual by the name of Limad al-Azdi, who was from the Azd Shanwah tribe of Yemen. And what he was well known for before accepting Islam is he was known as like a, you know, what you could call like a gin buster. Right, so he was like an exorcist kind of, and he traveled to Mecca some time for some business, and what he would do is people would hire him, ask him to do his magic and then do whatever ruqya or whatever that you got and water stuff and whatever he had, and then it would heal people or uh, fix people's jinn problems. And so he went to Mecca as usual for business. And when he was walking around at night, he heard there was some kids that were talking about this person called the Prophet Muhammad, and they were calling him Muhammad Majnoon, uh, crazy Muhammad, right? That's what they were calling him. And so the Med asked the kids, where can I find this Muhammad? Where can I find this Muhammad? And so they told him where they can find him, and because the Med assumed that the Prophet Muhammad was affi afflicted by some evil, he thought, maybe I can help him. Maybe this is a good business opportunity. So the Med, he met with the Prophet Muhammad and he offers him to help him with his so called uh, jinn problem, right? Tell me what's going on, you know, uh, what's been affecting you, uh, let me diagnose you. And so the Prophet Muhammad, instead of responding to the ridiculous claims of him being a jinn, he decides to just give some da'wah instead. And he says, you know, a, a, a sentence, or not really a sentence, but a, a, some phrases that we hear almost every single week in the Jum'ah Khutbah, where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu says, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu, ma yahdi Allah fala mudlillah, wa ma yudlil fala hadiyalah, wa ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah, wahdahu la sharika lah. The Prophet Muhammad what does he say? He says that ultimate praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we seek only his assistance. Whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, there is no force that can misguide him. And whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause to lead astray, they cannot be guided by Allah. And I bear witness that I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship. He is absolutely unique in this regard and he has no partners. When Limed heard this, he was stunned. His mind was blown by this speech. So much so that he wanted to hear it multiple times. So he kept asking the Prophet Muhammad to repeat it by saying, That he was so impressed by the speech of the Prophet Muhammad. He said, repeat it for me because these words of yours that you have just said, it is as if they have reached the middle of the ocean, which is... Uh, you know, it doesn't make sense in English, but in Arabic, it just means that it's, it's, it's mind-blowing, right? This is something that is mind-blowing. And so, three times the Prophet Muhammad would repeat this. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu, ma yahdihillah fala mudlilalah, wa ma yudlil fala hadiyalah, wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, until he said it, repeated it three times. And so the Med was very inspired by these words, and he said to the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, Wallahi, laqad sami'tu qawl al-kahna. I have heard the words of soothsayers, wa qawl al-sahara, and I have heard the words of magicians, wa qawl al-shu'ara, and I have heard the words of poets, fa ma sami'tu mithla ha'ulai al-kalimat, and I have never heard words like yours. Sorry. فَهَلُمَّ يَدَكَ أُبَايِعْكَ عَلَى الْإِسْلَامِ I have, uh, give me your hand so that I can give you the pledge of Islam. 
And so then, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu فَبَايَعْهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ So he extends his hand and he allows the mad to say the shahada and to take the oath of Islam, take the pledge of Islam. And then he says to the mad, وَعَلَى uh, قَوْمِكَ Will you basically, uh, 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 for your people, basically what the Prophet Sallallahu is telling the mad here is, will you take this message to your people? Will you make sure that your people accept Islam the same way that you did? And so he responds and he gives him the promise, وَعَلَى قَوْمِي I will do that. I, yes, I promise you. I'll take this to my people. And I'm confident that they will listen to me. And I will not rest until they have all accepted Islam. Now, what's very interesting here is the Mad, he goes back to his tribe. And essentially, you know, we don't really hear much from the Mad in the Sirah after that. However, many years later, in the Madani period, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he sent a group of Sahaba to preach and spread the message of Islam. And a group of them were sent out in the, in the direction in where the Mad, uh, uh, his tribe lived in. And so along their journey, they passed by the Med's tribe. And the Sahaba camped amongst this tribe. Now before the Sahaba left and started on their journey again, the leader of that group of Sahaba asked the rest of the Sahaba, right? So, فَقَالَ صَاحِبُ الْجَيْشِ That he said to the rest of the Sahaba, هَلْ أَصَبْتُ مِنْ هَأُولَاءِ الْقَوْمِ شَيْئًا Did you guys take anything from these people? So this is one of the etiquettes that we learn that whenever you uh, go settle upon a tribe or you visit a city that's not yours and uh, people take you in, even those things that are public, even those things that are for everybody, the etiquette of the Muslims is that we use it while we are there, but we don't take these things. We don't just take these things. Uh, one example that I was thinking of when I was reading this narration, I thought of hotels. You know how we all like to just take things from hotels? You know, if we just think that, oh, because I, uh, I paid a lot of money for the hotel, I can just take uh, the, the towels, I can take whatever. No, 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 that's not, that, that's not the etiquette of a Muslim. The etiquette of a Muslim is that anything that is given to us in terms of public use, we are able to use it when we need to, but then we leave it to the public after that. So one man said, فَقَالَ رَجُلٌ مِّنْهُمْ One of the Sahaba, he said, yes, I actually, I actually did take something. I took a, I took a midhara, right? I took a... A midhara is like a, a, a lota. That's basically what it is, right? It's a small container, and it can be filled with water, and people would use it to clean themselves in the restroom, or it would even be used for wudu. And so this Sahabi, he said, when I went to the town, I saw this little water container in the public area, and I took it because we didn't have one on our journey, and we needed it. So I took one, because it was, it was public. Eh? Anybody can take it. But the leader of the Sahaba, what did he say? He said, رُدَّهَا عَلَيْهِمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ قَوْمُ الْدُّمَاتِ Right? The leader of the Sahaba in this, in, the, in this instance, he said, go and return it back to them. Return it back to them. Uh, regardless, you should always return it back to them. But especially because these are the people of Limad. These are the people of Limad. So the man came to the Prophet Muhammad and he accepted Islam at the hands of the Prophet Muhammad and he swore allegiance to the Prophet and he swore that he will preach Islam to all his people until they accepted and pledged their loyalty to the Prophet, right? So this, he had a very special status amongst the Sahaba, and he was known amongst the Sahaba, even though many of the Sahaba didn't get to actually meet him, didn't actually get to speak to him face to face. But uh, uh, this is why the Sahabi, the leader and of the Sahaba in this instance, he says, go back and return this water container back to the people of Bumad. Now, at this point in the Sirah, the Muslims are gaining strength. The Muslims are more more and more people are accepting Islam and the people that are accepting Islam are people who are of all facets of life right so those who you know maybe have been oppressed for a majority of their life those who are even rich like Uthman ibn Affan or Abu Dhar al-Ghifari or uh, you know many other companions uh, uh, Mus'ab ibn Umair other companions like them who have had a lot of success in the dunya sense they were even also accepting Islam. So all different types of people are accepting Islam. And this is a sign of a true religion. When those who are weak, those who are oppressed, those who are strong and those who are not oppressed, everybody sees the truth in this one religion. And it's symbolic because as well when the Prophet ﷺ in the Madani period, and also when it comes to Najashi, which we'll talk about extensively next week, inshallah ta'ala, but 
uh, one of the questions that all these leaders would do and the delegations that were sent to different tribes and, and leaders, one of the questions that the leaders would always ask is what type of people follow the prophet? Why t what type of people follow the prophet? Because part of the prophecy is that those who are weak, those who are oppressed, those who have no hope, they're going to be given a prophet and a deen that gives them hope and gives them liberation. And so this is the example of the Prophet ﷺ and Islam. And so, you know, another thing as well is when it comes to, when it comes to the Meccan period of Islam, when it comes to the Meccan period of Muslims, one thing that we always look into this and we always constantly say to ourselves, oh, the Muslims were weak during this time. Oh, the Muslims did not have power during this time. This could not be further from the truth, right? As a matter of fact, the power of Islam continuing to grow is, is very evident here. And uh, you only oppress something that is a threat. You only oppress something that is a threat. You only try to end something that is a threat. If the Prophet Muhammad and the Muslims were weak, the leaders of Quraysh would not have a reason to oppress them, would not have a reason to try to drive them out of their homes, would not have a reason to try to torture them and kill them. And this is important in terms of current circumstances and current climate to keep into consideration. One of the things that bothers me the most and not just myself, but a lot of people as well, is when we hear the common trope that Muslims are weak, Muslims are divided, Muslims can't figure it out. And so what do we do? We just accept it. We're just like, that's it, right? Ibn Khuldun, rahimahullah, famous historian, and you can kind of consider him to be like a sociologist, where he looks, he traveled significantly around the world, and he wrote books. And one of the books that he wrote is called al muqaddimah which is a book where he basically talks about all the places that he visited and commonalities that he found within mu different Muslim tribes and, and Muslim, Muslim dif different Muslim countries and lands and areas, but also just commonalities about humanity in general. And one thing that he states is that every Muslim nation, every generation of Muslims is one moment away from actualizing the power that they have. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not leave a Muslim nation without having some type of power that they can actualize. The question is, is whether they will hold on to that power or not and go forth and do something with that power. Now, why do I say this? I th say this because Muslims are strong. Muslims have a lot of strength. Muslims are individuals who, and as a collective body, where we have a lot of potential to make a strong impact. I'm telling you right now, I don't care what philosophy you think is dominating the world, Islam is dominating every single philosophy, every single ideology. Every person that hears the truth of Islam is attracted to Islam, whether they like it or not. Whether they, 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 they pretend to hate it or not, it deep down there is something that happens in the heart when people hear about Islam that makes them question, that makes them, uh, that, that, that makes them understand, that makes them want to hear more, that makes them want to uh, think about what is going on and we see this in the seerah as well Some of the most staunch enemies of Islam are people that deep down They actually felt Islam to be true and it's their fear of accepting that that caused their rage and hatred to increase And had the Muslims not been powerful there would have been no reason to oppress them in the first place If your voice was not powerful there would be no reason for Netanyahu to call every single social media company to try to shadow ban hashtag Palestine there's, there's no reason for it. If your voice was not powerful, there would be no reason for Anthony Blinken to go around in every single Muslim country and try to get fatawa from, from so-called scholars to say to the people, uh, don't talk about Gaza, you guys don't understand, and other, uh, your, your leaders are wise and you guys are not wise. If it wasn't for your guys' power, if it wasn't for the Muslim power, if it wasn't for the Muslim voice and the Muslim religion, there would not have been a shift in the public opinion for Palestine. Never think you are weak. Never think you are weak, especially as a Muslim Ummah. And what's so powerful, especially with this upcoming, I know I'm ranting, but who cares, uh, with the so-called, uh, with, with this election that is coming up in 2024 right now, right? One thing that is very interesting, and this kind of goes back to Ibn Khuldun's point, of every Muslim nation, every Muslim community, every generation has a power and has an ability to bring an act, uh, an act about change that they, they just need to actualize that power, they need to realize their power. Every swing state in America, every sw swing state in America, in 2020, it was the 1% Muslim vote in those swing states 
that allowed Biden and the Democrats to be elected. And so it is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Muslims who are 1% of the American vote the same power as 51% of the American vote. And we want to call ourselves weak, and we want to call ourselves hopeless, and we want to call ourselves uh, disunited. But we just have to actualize that power. And that's why the abandoned Biden campaign is something that, first of all, I fully endorse, just for everybody's record, everybody to know. And then on top of that as well, it's why everybody should be on top of this as well. That if you show that the Muslims have the ability to punish a candidate, then candidates will have to start uh, listening to the Muslims, whether they like it or not. Because they don't think so. They don't think so. There's a lot of people, a lot of Muslims in, that work in the White House that hear from Joe Biden, that hear from other members of the White House and different White House cabinets. And all they're hearing is that the Muslims aren't going to punish the Democrats because they can't unite. They can't figure out what to do. They'll just, you know, they're so scared of Trump that they'll vote for Biden regardless. Even though Trump ended two wars and Biden started uh, two wars, right? We talk about lesser of two evils. If you want to talk about lesser of two evils, then, you know, let's look at it objectively. I'm not endorsing anybody, just FYI. And so there's this fear that it's like, okay, you know, regardless of what we do, we're going to have a candidate that hates us. You know what? You're right. You're probably right. But at the same time, you have nothing to lose. So why not, as Muslims, should we try to have an opportunity to flex our muscles a little bit and show that maybe we do have political power here? Maybe we do have political power here that we didn't think that we had before. Why not at least try it? If the result is going to be bad for the Muslims regardless of what happens, why not try to do something that we've never done before that can result in actual political change? That yes, we won't see the result of it now, but four years down the line, Democrats will understand what? that if you ever want to get elected again, you will have to answer to the Muslims because they have the ability to uh, punish you now, right? So don't, don't ever have this mentality that you guys are weak, that this, the Muslims are weak, Muslims are disunited, Muslims are divided. This is a, a, a colonized mindset. This is what they want you to think. And so there's so many systems that are set up that today in the UK, a movement that has been in the UK for 70 years who is non-violent movement, it's a peaceful movement, has been labeled as a terrorist organization. Why? Because the head of that movement in the UK, he went on the Piers Morgan show, he humiliated Piers Morgan in front of everybody, and Piers Morgan started uh, saying extremely Islamophobic uh, uh, comments in his rage and in his anger of being humiliated by this guy in a debate. And so now so many people started sympathizing with the movement. And so many people started uh, accepting Islam. So many people started coming to this individual and receiving da'wah and receiving uh, lessons of the Qur'an from the this, from this same individual that was on that Piers Morgan show. And so today the UK does what? We're putting this as a terrorist organization. Even though they have never touched anybody, they've never hurt a fly. Yeah, some other, you know, uh, opinions when it comes to how to unite the Muslim Ummah is something that scholars may disagree with and things like that. But that's not the point. The point is, is that as a country that so-called claims free speech will look at a, 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 a movement that has been there for 70 years and has not touched a fly and will claim them as a terrorist organization when the actual biggest terrorist organization in the world that has killed 30,000 civilians in the past three months and 15,000 children is so-called your hero and uh, who you bend down to and who you are lapdogs to. Well, uh, anyways, final point. Final point I'm trying to make here is what? The idea that Muslims are weak, the idea that Muslims are oppressed, this is not true. This is not true. If this were the case, we would be ignored, not oppressed. And so the, 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 just the sheer reality of people trying to suppress us is an indication that our religion is something that uh, uh, people are uh, uh, wanting to bring down. And it has power, it has strength. So, the brain trust of Quraysh, they got together and they discussed who amongst them would be the best at identifying magic, at jinn possession, mental instability and insanity and things like that, right? Because they were talking about the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, who they saw as someone who divided their community, who belittled their way of life, who exposed the faults within their religion. And so they decided 
that a companion, uh, uh, not a companion, sorry, a, a leader of Quraysh by the name of Utbah bin Rabia would be the most qualified person to determine the issues of magic and mental illness. And Utbah bin Rabia, he, he was a leader of Quraysh, he was very well read, he was very politically influential, he was very wealthy, he was very well traveled. So Utbah was also one of the few people who has stood in the court of kings of that time. So he stood in the court of the emperor of Rome. He stood in the court of the king of Abyssinia. So what he did is he approached the Prophet Muhammad and tried to emotionally blackmail him. So he comes to the Prophet and he says, Ya Muhammad, anta khayrun am Abdullah? Oh Muhammad, are you better or is your father Abdullah better? And so, fasakata. Rasulullah he remained quiet. And then he asked him another question. Anta khayrun am Abdul Muttalib? Are you better or is your grandfather Abdul Muttalib better? He's trying to, you know, start an argument here. And the Prophet ﷺ, he's not going to engage with ridiculous things like this. And so then he says, قال, أنت خير أم هاشم? Right? Are you better or is your forefather Hashim better? Fasakata Rasulullah. He stayed quiet. And so then he asks him, uh, or he says to him, فإن كنت تزعم أن هؤلاء خير منك فقد عبدوا الآلهة الآلهة التي عبتها وإن كنت تزعم أنك خير منهم فتكلم حتى نسمع قولك ما رأينا سخلة قط أشأم على قومك منك فرقت جماعة وشتت أمرنا وفضحتنا في العرب. So he says, your forefathers used to worship these idols that you talk badly about all the time. And so if you think you are better than them, let's see what you have to say. We've never seen anyone more of a troublemaker for his people than you. You divided our community. You, hum you humiliate us in front of other Arabs. So, you've humiliated us in front of other Arabs. You've mocked our way of living. We are not going to wait for anything. We are done with you. You need to stop what you are doing. People are saying that there is a possessed man amongst the Quraysh. We're done dealing with you. We'll raise our swords against you. But we don't want to get to that point. So we have made an offer for you. Again, look here. If the Muslims were not strong, if the Prophet Muhammad and his religion and his people did not have strength, why would the Quraysh try to broker a deal with them so that they stop their message, so that they stop their ways? Because they know it is, it is appealing to the people, it is appealing to the masses, that the public opinion is shifting against them, and so therefore they are trying to do everything they can to suppress it. They will bribe, they will raise their sword, they will go through the ends of the earth to try to suppress their religion. But the one thing that they will not do is listen. They don't listen. And so what they say to this to the Prophet Muhammad is, we've gathered enough wealth from all the wealthy people from Quraysh. We've created a fund to make you the wealthiest man in Mecca. All you need to do is just quit this foolishness. We'll even marry you to the 10 most beautiful women in Mecca. The 10 most beautiful women of your choice, we will marry you to all of them. And so Utbah, he keeps making offers. But they're forgetting this is the same person who said that if you put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand, I will never give up preaching this deen. Because this deen is not about the dunya. And the truthfulness of the Prophet wasallam is had he done this for power, he would have compromised so long ago because he was given the entire world by the Quraysh. But he never cared about the dunya. He never cared about the worldly pleasures of this life. That's what makes him a truthful prophet. He only cared about enacting the mission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That in his lifetime, he had come across, in terms of material wealth, millions of dollars, especially in the Madani period. Tens of millions of dollars came across the Prophet Muhammad's hands. Tens of millions. But this is the same prophet in the Madani period who was the leader of the 
greatest community that this world has ever seen. The same leader who Aisha Radwana has said that the stove would not turn on for a few months and the only thing that we would eat is dates and water. Because they had nothing. Even though the Prophet ﷺ kept being given everything. Why? Because he would give it all away. This was not what he, who his life was. So Allahu Alam, how much money came across his hands during his lifetime. But what is for certain guaranteed is the Prophet Muhammad died without a penny to his name. And that's, that's who the leader is. So much so that when he was walking with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and he entered into the city of Medina, the people didn't know who was the Prophet and who was Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And then when people would come into the city of Medina and they would see a gathering of the Sahaba with the Prophet Muhammad they wouldn't know which one amongst them is the Prophet Muhammad because he eats like them, he drinks like them, he wears clothes like them, because he is a leader, he is a true prophet. And the same prophet who in the battle of Khandaq, when the uh, companions were struggling, and they were hungry, and they were tired, and they lifted their, their shirts to show the Prophet ﷺ that they tied rocks to their stomach to put pressure on the stomach so that it suppresses the feeling of hunger. And what did the Prophet ﷺ do? He lifted his shirt and he had two stones tied to his stomach because the Prophet ﷺ being a truthful prophet and a leader, he did not expect anything out of himself or out of others that he did not expect out of himself twice or even more. That's the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. That in that same battle of Khandaq, when Jabir ibn Abdullah and his wife finally got some food together for the, for the companions, the 800 companions that were hungry and suffering and, and struggling. And Jabir ibn Abdullah said, we only have one animal, so invite maybe a few people, but we can't invite any more. And the Prophet ﷺ, what does he do? He invites the whole entire community. He says, party at Jabir's house. Jabir ibn Abdullah was, was shocked. He was worried. He was scared. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I told you, only bring a few people. We don't have enough. He says, when you get there, cook the food, cover the pot, cook the bread, cover the bread, and I'll get there and I'll start serving. The Prophet ﷺ, he serves all 800 people from that same pot and from that same uh, uh, basket of bread. And then he serves Jabir ibn Abdullah, and then he serves Jabir ibn Abdullah's wife, and then he eats last himself. Because he's a true leader and he's a true prophet. So Utba, he keeps making offers, he keeps making offers, and the Prophet ﷺ, the entire time he's quiet. And then he says to him, Faragda, which in other words he says what are you done and then the Utbah he says yeah I'm done and the Prophet وسلم, he says A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem Bismillahir Rahman Rahim Hamim and so he starts and he says that I seek refuge from Shaitan I seek refuge by, uh, 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 in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the cursed shaitan. And in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most gracious, Hamim, which is one of the huruf al muqatta, right? The disjointed letters in the Quran. And these disjointed letters is something that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what it means. And it's a very humbling thing to read these verses because it reminds us that no matter how much Arabic we learn, no matter how much tafsir we read, we never really will truly know what these words mean. And that is why it's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because He is the all-knowing and He is the all-hearing and He is the all-seeing. And so something like this is unusual to the Arabs. Especially someone who knows poetry so well like Utbah. Someone who knows, uh, you know, soothsaying so well like Utbah. Who knows literature so well like Utbah was very intelligent. So hearing Hamim, it almost grips him. It shocks him. And then he is he's listening now. And the Prophet Sallallahu he goes and he recites the first 13 verses of Surah Fussilat. Tanzilu min ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kitabun fussilat ayatuhum Qur'anan arabiyan liqawmi ya'lamun. Bashira wa nadhira fa'arada akhtharuhum fahum la yasma'oon. وَقَالُوا قُلُوبُنَا فِي أَكِنَّةً مِمَّا تَدْعُونَا إِلَيْهِ وَفِي آذَانِنَا وَقَرُوا وَمِنْ بَيْنِنَا وَبَيْنِكَ حِجَابٌ فَعْمَلْ إِنَّنَا عَامِلُونَ This Qur'an, it inspires people. This Qur'an, it lifts people up. This Qur'an, it warns people. This Qur'an is, 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 is what brings glad tidings to people. And most of the people, they turn away from it. But that's because they don't bother to listen to it. 
and they say that our hearts are, are covered up in, in kinna, right? Which is like a peeled fruit, right? It's like a, like, like a peel of a fruit, something that's very delicate, something that's very delicate. So our ears seem to be blocked. And there's something that stands between us and you. So you go do what you have to do and let us do what we have to do. The Prophet Muhammad is responding to all of Utbah's words with the words of the Quran, with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ يُوحَى إِلَيْهِ أَنَّمَا إِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهُ وَاحِدٌ فَاسْتَقِيمُوا إِلَيْهِ وَاسْتَغْفِرُوهُ وَوَيْلُ لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ Say, O Prophet, I am only a man like you and it has been revealed to me I'm just like the rest of you. But there's one primary difference. I receive direct messages from Allah. And the object of your worship needs to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. The one Allah. Stand up. Serve Him. Seek repentance from Him. And how unfortunate are those people who associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. الَّذِينَ لَا يَأْتُونَ الزَّكَاةِ وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ كَافِرُونَ These people, these same people, they're not socially aware of what's going on around them. They're not people who serve their communities. So they, they don't pay the zakat. They don't uh, give charity. And they, these people also deny belief in the hereafter. <laughs> but those who believe and those who do good will certainly have a never-ending reward. Right? And this is what awaits for them for eternity. قُلْ أَإِنَّكُمْ لَتَكْفُرُونَ بِالَّذِي خَلَقَ الْأَرْضَ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ وَتَجَعَلُونَ لَهُ أَنْدَادًا ذَلِكَ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say to them that do you people really deny in the one who created this earth in only two days? Now pause. It's not a tafsir class so I'm not going to go into the whole discussion of what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mean when he says he created the earth in six days and two days. What does all this mean? Because we also know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said kun fayakun. Meaning that if he, want, if he wants to, if it's his will, he, all he needs to say is kun, and it, it, it is. And then even the scholars interpret it and they say that he doesn't even actually need to say the word kun, this is a metaphor, because bayn al-kafi wa noon it already happened. Between the, 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 the letter kaf and the letter noon in the kun, it already happened before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even needs to say. Right? This is the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this, 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 what is being said here is ikraman. Right? Out of honor for the people of the earth, out of honor for you and me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He showed care in creating the world. Right? And we don't interpret the two days as two 24-hour days like we do. Days in, in, the, in the realm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and we won't understand. So for example, if someone spends two whole days cooking for you as their guest, Versus ordering takeout 45 minutes before you show up. What will make you feel more honored? Right? What will make you feel more special? It's the, it's the two days, right? If you're a bad cook, just go take out, inshallah, okay, right? But, you know, but if you're a good cook, show that honor to your, to your guests. So the Prophet ﷺ, he continues. And after all of that, all the world that you see, you, you create partners for him. When he alone is the sustainer and everything that is in exi existence, وَجَعَلَ فِيهَا رَوَاسِيَ مِنْ فَوْقِهَا وَبَارَكَ فِيهَا وَقَدَّرَ فِيهَا أَقَوَاتَهَا وَفِي أَرْبَعَةِ أَيَامٍ سَوَاءَ لِلسَّائِلِينَ And he placed on this earth firm mountains to hold the earth together. Standing high, showered his blessings upon the earth. And he ordained all its means of sustenance, totaling four days exactly for all those who ask. All the sustenance of his creation was planned. And this is information for anyone who wants to know. For four days, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after creating the earth in two days, has just adorned this earth. Then he turned towards the heavens when it was still like smoke. Right? He raised himself up above the heavens. Heavens at the time, it was, it was just smoke. And then he commanded the earth and heavens to submit to him and worship him. And both the heavens and the earth, they bowed down willingly to him. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, he completed the heavens in seven different levels. Then he gave each levels its ob objective and its role. Then Allah says, He took the lowest of the skies of the heaven and adorned it with stars like lanterns. 
and he put them there as protection and therefore guidance and direction. And all of this was determined by the one who is all-knowing. And if they turn away, then say, O Prophet, I warn you of a mighty blast like the one that befell Ad and Thamud. Now at this point, the 13th verse of Surah Fussilat, after all of this, if people continue to neglect and ignore this truth, then you tell them that I've warned you. I've warned you about the sa'iqatan, which is a, a punishment that's like a ball of fire, a, a, a thunderbolt, a very destructive force. And just like the destructive force that destroyed and obliterated the people of Ad. And it's beautiful that this is what's being said to Utbah ibn Rabia, because Utbah ibn Rabia is an Arab who is very educated about the history of the Arabs, and he knows that Ad and Thamud are Arab tribes that were ruined, and he's very familiar with the Arabs. And so the Prophet ﷺ quotes this ayah to Utbah, but if they turn away, then say, I have warned you of a, of a blast like the blast that struck Ad and Thamud. One narration says Utbah's reaction was immediately, he started screaming, and he said, Hasbuk, Hasbuk, please stop, please stop. Isn't there anything else you can say to me besides this? He's panicking. And so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he replies and says, No, that's my message to you. That's my message to you. And so then Utbah reached out and grabbed the mouth of the Prophet Sallallahu and said, Uskut, quiet. And then when Utbah was recalling the words of the Prophet to the Quraysh, he said, I was afraid that if Muhammad kept going, the sky would have come right down on me. And I got like a punishment. That it was going to fall right on me. And the Quraysh replied, what's wrong with you, man? We sent you to Muhammad to get him to be quiet. And you come back with your tail between your legs. Talking about how scared you are? Utbah replied, Muhammad has never lied. And you guys know this. I've traveled across the world. I've met the greatest soothsayers. I've met the most eloquent speakers, the greatest poets. I've talked with these people. But when I heard what the Prophet Muhammad was saying, I knew it was not of this earth. And so when Utbah was first going back to his people, the Quraysh, they looked at his face and they were thinking, this man, he looks different. This is not the same man that we sent to talk with Muhammad And so Utbah said to him, or to the leaders of Quraysh, I said everything you guys wanted me to say to him. And the people asked, well, did he understand what you said? He said, I don't remember what he said. All I remember is the punishment that he was warning that awaits you like the people of Adam the moon. So the people were disheartened by this and they turned away. Another narration about Utbah's reaction says that Utbah said to the Quraysh that I put my hand on his mouth and told him to stop for the sake of his family. You people know that when Muhammad speaks, he doesn't lie. And so when Utbah came back from talking with the Prophet, he was terrified, and he looked like he was dazed, and everyone was confused. And so the word that was going around Mecca was now Utbah believes what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu believes. And when Abu Jahl heard this, about this whole situation, he went to Utbah for some damage control, right? Abu Jahl, he goes to Utbah for some damage control. You are starting to become sympathetic to the cause of those who are oppressed. Therefore, we need to send in Anthony Blinken to make sure that you're still on our side. And so, Utbah is older than Abu Jahl and someone that Abu Jahl respects. So Abu Jahl says to Utbah, your own people believe that you've forsaken the religion of your forefathers. That people would like to gather some money and give you a gift, a bribe. We want to make sure you're okay. It seems as though you're not the same as before when you spoke to Muhammad We see that you are sympathetic to the cause of the Palestinians. But if you start posting, if you start advocating for them, we won't be able to do anything for you. But if you just ignore them for some more time until we can deal with them the way that we want to deal with them, we will pay you, we will make you the richest man, you will have everything that you want in this dunya, just turn a blind eye. And so Abu Jahl, he says to Utbah, your own people believe that you have forsaken the religion of your forefathers. And Utbah replies, he says, I don't need the money. I got more money than all of you guys put together. And so Abu Jahl said, then what's wrong with you? 
if you won't accept their gift, you have to say something that can be out as an official press release that Utbah rejects Muhammad. And so Utbah, he said, what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to say? There's not a single person amongst you who knows poetry like I do. There is no one amongst you who knows poetry and eloquence better than I do. Nobody knows black magic and the jinns better than I do. And what this man, Muhammad, said to me was nothing like magic and Susayn. What he said had a certain sweetness to it, unlike anything that I've ever tasted in my life. It was soothing. It's a sweetness that is eternal. It's not an artificial sweetness. It's a natural sweetness. It's as though the top of the tree bears fruits, and its roots are very deep and strong. And it overcomes and does not become overcome or defeated by anything, and it crushes anything that it steps on. You know, what's very profound here is, you know, the sweetness of this life in terms of natural and artificial sweetness is very similar to our Iman. So there's a lot of things in this life that are artificially sweet, right? And these are our desires. When we engage in our desires, we feel pleasure in the moment, but then later on the effects of that comes and we start to regret it. Right? You know, like when someone consumes too much candy, someone consumes too much chocolate, someone cons consumes too much sugar, someone consumes too much Nutella. Right? I love Nutella a lot. But if you consume too much of it, you start to feel the health effects of it. Your teeth will start to hurt, you'll start to crash, you'll start to become, you know, very tired and lethargic. And so this is what we call artificial sweetness. The sweetness that is great in the moment, but then it doesn't really last. But then as you grow and mature, as you grow to appreciate the natural things of life, no matter how many Snickers you've eaten in your life, no matter how many times Sn Snickers says in their commercial, Snickers satisfies, right? Literally trying to manipulate people into uh, consuming their desires. This is, all, this is what you need in order to satisfy yourself. Nike, just do it, right? Just do it. Do whatever you want to do. But these, these artificial things, you know, when, when it's consumed so much, it starts to have our, our bad health effects. But then the natural stuff, you know, you go back home to Pakistan, you go back home to India, you go back home to Egypt or Bangladesh, and you pick a mango right off the fruit tree, right off the mango tree, fresh, and you eat that. Tell me what's better than that. What's sweeter than that? What is better than that? And as you grow and mature in your wisdom, and then also in your taste buds, <laughs> you appreciate that stuff a lot more than the artificial stuff. And that's the iman that we have. The Quran, ibadah, salah, fasting, all that stuff, that's the natural sweetness. And so when Utbah says here, it's, there's a certain sweetness to the Qur'an unlike anything I've ever tasted in my life, is because in his life, he has only consumed artificial sweetness and now he is consuming natural sweetness. And regardless on your opinion of music, right? Oh, Ibn Hazm said it's, it's permissible. Okay, but he was talking about music of the Prophet and, the, 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 and Allah, not about, you know, not Nicki Minaj and Cardi B. I hate to break it to you, right? But regardless of what your opinion is on that, the, the scholars say there is no way that somebody's heart is enveloped with music and they can appreciate the sweetness of the Qur'an. Fully. Fully. So we're consuming things and the Qur'an and the ibadah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is standing on the side and saying, what's wrong with you? I'm the best thing. I'm that natural mango from the fruit tree and you're consuming Snickers and Sour Patch Kits. Why? And so, Abu Jahl said, if you don't leave anything other than what you said to me, your people will reject you. All the wealth and respect of your people will be gone. And so Utbah, he said, leave me, let me think about this. Utbah, he didn't feel any different about the Prophet Quran and the message. What happened is that he realized what he'll have to give up and what was at stake. Utbah saw the torture of Abu Bakr Siddiq beaten until he was unconscious at the Haram. He saw that Uthman ibn Affan was extremely wealthy and rich, and now he's on the brink of being driven out of the, the, whole, entire, the whole entire town. 
He saw Uthman ibn Affan being chained up and tortured. He saw Ammar and his parents Yasir and Sumayya anhum tied up and tortured. He saw both of his parents killed by Abu Jahl. And so not willing to make the sacrifice for the truth, Utbah makes a public announcement. Forgive me everybody, I've been missing for a couple days because I was recovering from Muhammad's powerful magic. This magic, it really messes with you. That's why I've been absent and dazed for two days. You know that I'm the strongest and most educated amongst you. I was able to overcome the Prophet Muhammad's magic, unlike his followers. That's because I am genetically and intellectually superior, but the rest of his followers, they're sheep. And so when the Prophet heard this, he was hurt. He says, these people just don't get it. They just don't get it. When the Prophet was giving his speech to Utbah, he saw the message penetrate Utbah's heart. He saw the look in Utbah's eyes. When Utbah put his hand on Muhammad's uh, mouth and begged him to stop. And so, confused by this, upset by this, hurt by this, because the Prophet you have to remember, this is his people. These are his family members. These are his tribesmen. These are the people that he grew up with. And it's because of his love that he has for his people, he wants them to accept Islam. So you have to remember, he, the Prophet ﷺ isn't just talking to some random person. And he's allowed to hell with you, that's it. This is who the Prophet Muhammad the, 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 these are the people that the, the Prophet ﷺ grew up with, that showed him care, that loved him when he was young, that treated him as family when he was an orphan. And then now that he's grown up and he's trying to preach to them, they're, they're backstabbing him, they're torturing his people, they're torturing his followers, and they're trying to suppress his message and his religion. It hurts a lot, right? We think that it's outside forces that are oppressing the Prophet ﷺ. No, it's his own family that's oppressing him. And so, in this amount of pain, the Prophet ﷺ doesn't have the words to respond to Utbah ibn Rubir. So instead, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reveals verses from Surah Al-Muddathir to protect and to console Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. ذَرْنِي وَمَنْ خَلَقَتُ وَحِيدًا it's as almost as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, leave it to me. And leave to me, O Prophet, the one that I created all by myself. I granted him abundant wealth. I granted him children by his side. I made life easy for him. Yet he is hungry for more. He is scared to give up everything that I have given him in the blessings for the truth and he wants more. Kalla, innahu kana li ayatina anida. But no, for he is certainly stubborn with our revelations. So urhiquhu sa'uda. So I will make his fate unbearable. Innahu fakkara wa qaddar. For he contemplated and he determined to bring down the Quran and, and, and degrade the Quran. May he be condemned for how evil was what he determined. May he be condemned even more how evil was what he determined. Then he recontemplated whether he should accept the Quran or not in private, in frustration. Then he frowned and scowled. Then turned back on the truth and acted arrogantly. What's amazing about this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing in real time what Utbah ibn Rabi'ah was doing in private. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah shocked. Saying this Quran is nothing but magic and from the ancients. Trying to spread propaganda trying to make up lies to bring down the Muslims. In هَذَا illa قَوْلُ bashar. This is no more than just a word of a man. Even though you yourself said that this is not a word of a man. So uslihi saqar. Don't worry, ya Muhammad, soon I will burn that man into hell. وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ مَا saqar. And what will make you realize what hell is? لا تبقي ولا تضر. It does not let anyone live or die. لَوَاحَةُ bashar, Scorching the skin. SubhanAllah, it does not let anyone live or die. What kind of life 
is it to spend eternity in the hellfire? The pain is it to be in the hellfire? So it's not a life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying this is not a life. But then you're not allowed to die either so that you can feel the punishment. It is, it is overseen by 19 keepers. Jazakallah khair. He heard me yelling and was like, this guy's throat needs it. And so these verses, these verses, scary verses, but they're also powerful verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is has the back of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's like when someone me messes with you and somebody else steps in, cracks their knuckles and says, I got your back. Why don't you go ahead? You carry on, I'll take care of this. And so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not knowing what to respond to Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, shocked because he's in pain. That someone that he's trying to call to Islam out of his love for him is treating him this way and saying these things about him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no worry, I'll take care of this. Now after this, the entire city of Mecca, even though they have resorted to violence against the Muslims, especially Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab, the oppression that the Muslims were going through wasn't a systematic oppression. But after this, it became that. It became... Now the entire Quraysh who are non-Muslim, we are going to have systemic oppression against the Muslims. An apartheid system. Try to capture them, try to trap them, try to oppress them, try to, you know, outcast them from society. They enter into certain areas in the marketplace, we'll try to kick them out. If they walk certain areas in the street, we'll try to kick them out. And an actual apartheid system is being built in Mecca by the leaders of Quraysh. And they would look for any excuse to harm the Muslims. However, you know, by the way, um, I'm not going to go into detail of the story because I shared it before in a previous class. But Al-Walid bin Mughayra had a very similar interaction with the Prophet Sallam as Utbah bin Rabi'ah. Very similar. It's almost identical. And uh, Tufail bin Amr was an individual who was coming from, uh, from Sham and was doing business in Mecca and he wanted to do tawaf around the Kaaba before. And Walid bin Mughayra, after having a similar interaction with Prophet Sallam, where he started to struggle with whether this is truth or not, and then Abu Jahl gets into his head and then he has to publicly announce all this kind of stuff. Tufail bin Amr, he hears the propaganda. He hears what they're saying about the Prophet Sallam. And they say, you know, uh, they set up a whole propaganda plan so that people that are coming in from Mecca, uh, to Mecca uh, hear that, that the Prophet is a magician, is a soothsayer, he's crazy, he's a liar, before they enter in Mecca, so that when they enter into Mecca and the Prophet Muhammad preaches, they don't listen to him. So Tufail bin Amr, he was a very smart man, very, very smart man. And so he was like, oh, what is this guy going to say that is going to stop me? I'm a smart, intelligent person. So at first he put cotton in his ears because he didn't want to hear from the Prophet Sallam, but then he remembered, I'm an intelligent person. So uh, let me just hear what he has to say. And so he sees the Prophet Muhammad Sallam preaching in Mecca after he had been told that this person is violent, this person is, 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 is evil, this person is this, right? All the Palestinians are, are, are violent, they're terrorists, and we need to get rid of all of them, whether they are men, women, or children. No facts or truth needed. We're just going to say it and you're going to roll with it and you're going to accept it. And if you don't accept it, then uh, you're anti-Semitic. So this is exactly the same thing that's happening here. So Tufail bin Amr, he takes off the cotton in his ears when he sees the Prophet Sallam praying at the Kaaba. When he sees him praying at the Kaaba. And he says in that moment, which was very powerful in that moment where the Prophet Sallam is praying in the Kaaba even more despite all the oppression that is going on around him. So that when we are seeing people being oppressed, when we witness people being oppressed, when we 
experience oppression ourselves, the key here, the lesson here is that just like the Prophet ﷺ continued his ibadah, we have to step up our ibadah because you want to hurt my brothers and sisters because they say la ilaha illallah. You want to hurt me because they say la ilaha illallah. Watch this, I'm going to worship Allah even more now. I'm going to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even more now. I'm going to pray even more. I'm going to fast even more. And so Walid bin Mughayra, after trying to create this whole entire propaganda campaign against the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, Tufail bin Amr hears the words of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he becomes, uh, he becomes really interested in it, he falls in love with it, he follows the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam back home, hears more about it, and then he accepts Islam. He accepts Islam. And so every time people try to extinguish the word of Allah, Allah will always let the light shine through. How many efforts are being done to try to extinguish the voice of the Muslims? But how many people are accepting Islam because of it? This is the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that violence and that aggression of the Muslims, it began to increase. It began to increase. The Quraysh cared for their power. They cared about their wealth and honor more than they cared about the truth. They know it's the truth. They know what they're committing with what they're doing is trying to commit an act of genocide against the Muslims. But the Prophet looked at Utbah and he saw the truth reach his eyes, reach his heart. And that he wanted to acknowledge the truth, but he still rejected it because he could not let go of the material. And so from here on out, things in Mecca took a turn for the worse for the Muslims. The violence and the aggression of Muslims increased and now it became publicly accepted. It became procedure. It became policy of all the Quraysh and all of Mecca to oppress the Muslims. And this led to the Muslims migrating to Habasha, to Abyssinia, to escape the persecution. And one of the verses that the Prophet ﷺ recited to Utbah that left Utbah dumbfounded was the ayah in Surah An-Nahl, which is an ayah that since the time of Umar ibn al-Aziz, the Khilaf of Umar ibn al-Aziz, rahimahullah, until today, we hear from the mimbar in the khutbah, Inna Allah ya'muru bil'adli wal-ihsani wa ita'i dhul qurba wa yanha an al-fahshai wal-munkari wal-baghi ya'idhukum la'allakum tadhakkaroon. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, He commands three things. He commands justice. Everybody needs to be just. Whether you are the leader of a country or whether you are the leader of your household. Whether you are an older brother or an older sister or whether you are uh, the person in your friend group that has influence and that people look to to, uh, you know, to to gain wisdom or to gain insight or to make up the plans for the, uh, uh, for the group, for the friend group. No matter who you are, you need to be someone who is just to everybody. You could be living alone with six cats. Be just to your cats. I'm serious. I don't, I don't know if people are smiling. I'm serious. Be just. And in everybody in their life, in one way or another, you have an authority over another person or another thing. So be just to all of that. Be just to all of that. You, don't, you live alone. You have nothing in your house. Be just to your food. That is, you know, a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right there. Be just to your food. Finish your food, don't throw it away, right? Don't eat too much so that you, uh, the, the food becomes something that is wasteful or israf, right? Try to buy things and try to use them immediately so that they don't get spoiled and that you throw them away. Be just to your food. Even something that small, right? That in every aspect of our life, we want to enact justice upon whatever we are, uh, what, whatever we are engaged in. So we can be from the Khalifa all the way to the food that we consume. Be just in everything. Well, Ihsan. Ihsan, Ihsan cannot be translated in English. I, I just, Ihsan is such a deep word, but the basic way I can translate Ihsan is try to do your best in everything that you do. Give it your all. Give it your all. No matter what it is in your life. Right? Now, you know, uh, there's that famous narration where, um, you know, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, he talks about how uh, uh, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala will always, will always give rizq to, to those who seek it, right? I, forgive me, I'm, I'm forgetting the wording of the hadith exactly in my head, but essentially that's the meaning of the hadith. And 
You know, I feel like this ummah, I feel like this ummah added a, a footnote to the hadith, right? And the footnote is, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide you risk as long as you are a doctor, engineer, or lawyer. But the reality is, right, in, 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 in my estimation and looking at the world, one of the reasons why the Muslim ummah um, and I talked. I already talked about. I already went on a whole rant about how I don't think the Muslim Ummah is weak, but we just need to actualize our power. That we have the power. The problem is, is that we don't. It's not that we don't have power. We have power. We just need to actualize it, right? But one of the things that we're doing that we're not actualizing our power is we're not going into different fields and becoming uh, powerful in those fields. Because there are certain entities in the world right now. There are certain ideologies. Zionism. Okay. Where no matter what field in this world you look at, they have they're dominating it in some way or another. Whether it's fast food, even if it's clothing. Even if it's clothing. Right? Like Timberland, like, like, like the shoe company Timberlands, for example. Right? There's no uh, the, the, it's one of those things that it's, it's supporting the, the Zionist regime and a genocidal regime. And so you're asking Muslims to boycott it, and absolutely we should. But one of the problems is what? We boycott things, but then we don't have an alternative. Because no parent wants their son to be a, sh a shoemaker. No parent wants their son to make clothes for other people. But even though somebody can go into this field, if they have ihsan, and this is what the concept of this global ihsan that we have to have. You have ihsan. With, 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 with one another and, and whatever job that we do, then you will always be successful. You'll always be successful. And there's, there's great honor in that. There's great honor in being able to provide for the ummah in every single direction. And that's what will, be, will bring a huge success to this ummah. وَإِتَائِذُ الْقُرْبَ right? And being generous and, and, and kind to those who are close to you, those who are your close relatives, those who are your close friends, those who are most beloved to your heart, you are kind and generous towards them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He forbids three things. So He commanded three things. Al-Ad, uh, justice, ihsan, being, uh, doing the best in whatever you are, you are doing. wa ita'i dhul qurba And to be generous to close relatives. And then He forbids three things. Yanha an al-fahsha. Fahsha is indecency. A fahsha is a type of sin that is associated often with lewdness. And this is because lewd sins break down family structures. It ruins families, it ruins communities, it spreads disease. And so it's a, it, this is fahsha, things that are associated commonly with filthy lewd acts, right? And then we believe that if someone wants to, wants to in, in, engage in their intimate desires, there's only one way to do that, and that is marriage through a man and a woman. Other than that, there is no reason for people to engage in Intimate desires. Anything outside of that is considered fahsha. Right? Then there's munkar and baghi, right? Munkar I'll say for the end, even though it comes second. But baghi is any act of aggression, any act of oppression, any act of injustice. It's the, it's the opposite of adl. So Prophet, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forbidding baghi. Munkar, you know, encompasses anything that is evil. Ya'muruna bil ma'roof wa yanhawna anal munkar. Right? to enjoin the good and to forbid the evil, anything that is evil. So fahsha and baghi is, uh, is under munkar. Fahsha and baghi are specific acts of uh, 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 aggression and transgression against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but munkar will just encompass all evil acts. So under munkar is fahsha and baghi. يَعِذُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ And he instructs you so that perhaps you will be mindful. And so this ayah was so powerful that it left Utbah speechless. And so when the Prophet Muhammad realized that there was nothing that he can do, and that he is in the fifth year of prophethood now. And this is when the Prophet Muhammad he reads to the companions, he gathers the companions and he reads to them Surah Al-Kahf. Because Surah Al-Kahf is a very powerful surah that... Surah Al-Kahf is a very powerful surah that talks greatly about oppression. That talks greatly about, uh, uh, you know, uh, striving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It talks greatly about those who are 
lessons and in, 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 in the, all the stories, there are so many lessons of people, you know, uh, striving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, going through oppression, uh, going through difficult tests, and coming out the other side. So the Prophet ﷺ reads to them Surah Al-Kahf as a reminder to the companions that this test you guys are going through, you will be successful. And that is when some of them begin to migrate to Abyssinia, where they will meet the King Najashi, and we will talk about that extensively next week, inshallah ta'ala. But before we go, do we have any questions, ya jama'a? Yes. Yes. So the three do's and three don'ts. So first of all, the ayah is in Surah An-Nahr, verse 90. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُوا بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِتَاءِ ذُو الْقُرْبَى وَيَنْهَا عَنَ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغِي يَعِذُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ That indeed Allah commands three things. Justice, right? So adl. He commands ihsan, right? And just write ihsan, you know, um, because ihsan is a very difficult word to be able to translate. But this idea of... Wow, okay. <laughs> um, downtown Seattle, y'all. MashaAllah. Um, ihsan, this idea of striving to, to do the best in whatever you are in, whatever field you are in, whatever act of worship you are in, whatever project you are in, you give everything your full ihsan. That's the third, which is being generous to those who are close to you. And then he forbids fahsha, which is uh, indecent sins. So that's usually associated with things that are considered to be lewd actions. Well, uh, munkar, munkar, which is, uh, you know, just any type of evil, any type of wickedness. And then well, baghi, which is oppression or aggression. Good? Okay. Any other questions? Others? No? Okay. Okay. Um, there's a question online here, and it's a good question. It's more of a comment, but I want to address it anyways. And it's good. This is good because we're supposed to have this dialogue so that we can, uh, you know, understand where, where others are, are coming from. You know, especially in our political climate, we don't want to have discourse where we are, um, you know, silencing other people's voices or even dismissing other people's thoughts and feelings when it comes to politics, especially within the Muslim community. This is something that I really believe that we need to be united on, inshallah ta'ala. But this comment here is basically saying that, you know, one of that they believe that one of the problems in the Muslim community when it comes to politics is that, you know, uh, people are preaching to hashtag abandon Biden which is like the campaign that's going on, but they're not giving the Muslims an alternative. They're not giving the Muslims an alternative. So how are we expecting people to abandon Biden when there is no other alternative and you know the other alternative is worse, right? Now again, whether the other alternative is worse, you know, I'm not here to engage in that discussion. Um, you know, I heard another imam once say, and this is what you know, I kind of you know, feel makes sense, but I heard another imam once say that uh, um, Biden uh, actually committed genocide, and uh, the argument is Trump could commit genocide. I would take the actual rather than the, rather than the possibility, right? Now, again, we're not saying to vote for one or the other, okay? And what's interesting here is it's very difficult for Look, okay, let me, I'm, I want to phrase this correctly. The Muslim community is not ready right now to mobilize behind a candidate. We don't have the ability in terms of our political vote and power to be able to uh, uh, prop up a candidate, right? To put up a candidate at the same level of Democrats or Republicans. I wish we could. That would be great if we could. 
but we can't. What we do have the ability to do, though, especially with the swing states and the amount of Muslims that are in the swing states, is to punish a candidate for committing genocide. Punish a candidate for not listening to the Muslims when we've told them time and time again that if you, if, if, if you don't call for a ceasefire or you don't at least try to reel in this genocide that is happening, then you will lose the Muslim vote completely, right? But, they, but they're, they're, they're acting as if they can do both. We'll get the Muslim vote in 2024, they'll forget all about this genocide, and we'll, we'll, we'll ca carry out the genocide as well. So there needs to be an actual punishment that happens, okay? Now the argument comes in and people start to argue and they say what? Who should we vote for then? Should we write in a candidate? Should we put free Palestine and write, write in that? That's great, do that if you want, right? Should we write in Cornell West as a third party candidate? If you wanna do that, that's what you wanna do. But also you're not gonna get the Muslim community to agree behind a candidate because every candidate is going to what? Is going to have something about that candidate that some aspect of the Muslim community does not agree with. Like Dr. Cornell West, as vocal as he is about Palestine, he has expressed positive remarks and support for Bashar al-Assad in the past. Now you've just d dismissed the entire Syrian struggle. So as a Muslim community, we don't have that ability yet to be able to mobilize behind one candidate. Whether it's because there is no candidate that we can mobilize behind, or whether it's because we just won't be able to fully agree. So I think it makes more sense to just hashtag a Biden, hashtag abandon Biden, generally, however you wish. You wanna vote for so-and-so, do that. You wanna write in so-and-so, do that. You don't wanna vote at all, do that as well. But the idea is that you want to remove as much votes as possible from Biden so that when he is punished, there needs to be serious reflection within the democratic community about how we're going to treat the Muslims in the future, right? And again, I mentioned at the beginning, we don't really have anything to lose. So why not at least try to actualize that power or that political power that we possibly could have? We don't know if we have it because we haven't tried. So why don't we try to see if we have it and start there, right? Wallahu alam. But anyways, yeah, I think a general approach makes more sense versus a specific candidate approach because we're not going to agree on who the specific candidate everybody should vote for is. Any other questions before we conclude? No? Okay. Tamam. I apologize, y'all. I know today was a very uh, politically driven halakha. <laughs> uh, I try not to do that often, but... Um, I just got, I, I got really frustrated today when I was seeing a lot of the, a lot of what was going on in the UK. And, uh, you know, as always, if you know what I'm talking about, khair. If you don't know, also khair. Alhamdulillah. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamu mursini wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If you do have any questions, uh, you can come up inshallah, no problem. And we can discuss. Oh, um, sorry, one announcement. Um... You know, if you guys haven't heard already, we do have a new th Thursday halaqa that is happening bi-weekly. It's a bi-weekly Thursday halaqa. It's a tafsir halaqa with Sheikh Ala Badr, right? Sheikh Ala is someone who has been in our MAPS community for a very long time. He is one of the foundations of our community, one of the, the pillars of our community. So there's a, uh, you know, we have a lot of respect for him. We have a lot of love for him here. And uh, so he'll be doing that. And I think this Thursday is going to be the first session. This Thursday will be the first session. And we'll start it after Isha, inshallah ta'ala. So please join us for that. And he will be covering the tafsir of Surah Yusuf. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.